Hi, I'm Kelly Cervantes, and this is Ceasing Life, a bi-weekly podcast produced by Cure Epilepsy. Today, I'm excited to welcome Jim Abrams to the podcast. If that name sounds familiar, it's because Jim is one of the creators of some of the biggest comedy films of all time, including Airplane, Top Secret, and The Naked Gun. In 1993, in the midst of writing, producing, and directing successful films and television shows, Jim's infant son, Charlie, was diagnosed with epilepsy. Jim is here today to tell the story of Charlie's treatment journey from medication to surgery to the ketogenic diet. It's a story that is both frustrating and remarkable and which highlights the importance of education and patient advocacy in the epilepsy community and the potential of the ketogenic diet as a treatment for epilepsy. Jim, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm so excited for our conversation. Um, To start things off, can you tell us about how Charlie's epilepsy first appeared and was diagnosed? Right. Well, Charlie was just about one year old after having a pretty normal first year. And right around his first birthday, I was pushing him on a swing in the front yard. And I noticed he just kind of flipped his hand in the air. And I didn't think much of it. But I asked Nancy um, whether she'd seen anything like that. And she said, yeah, she'd seen a bunch of things. And... um, so we made an appointment with a neurologist and, or actually just with his pediatrician. And then uh, the pediatrician said, you should be seeing a neurologist. And by the time we made an appointment with a neurologist, Charlie had his first tonic-clonic seizure. And, you know, that's not very difficult to diagnose. And it went on for about 20 minutes and we called the rescue squad and all that kind of stuff. And uh, that was the beginning. And the seizures rapidly escalated in duration, and frequency, and severity. Um, I would say within a week or, or two of that first kind of subtle thing. And what did the neurologists tell you when you finally got to meet with them? Did they give you a specific diagnosis? Eventually, Charlie was diagnosed with what they thought was lennox gasto syndrome. And they told us that uh, they would try a drug, a phenobarbital, because it had been around a long time. And we were sent on our way. Yeah, hand you the pills and see if they work. Pat in a handshake. And what did his treatment journey look like from there? I know that the phenobarbital didn't work. Correct. And so then there was a rapidly escalating bunch of drugs. I think back, this is 1993. So at the time, there were about eight or nine anti-epileptic drugs available. So we rapidly went through all the drugs. And at the same time, none of them worked. They all had adverse effects. And at the same time, you know, I was sort of at a peak in my career in the movie business. And so I didn't know it, but I I was inadvertently connected with lots of people who had connections at a lot of hospitals around the United States. So we wound up taking Charlie to the heads of pediatric neurology at Boston Children's Hospital, Seattle Children's, um, UCLA, uh, LA Children's, um, and he had seizures in all their arms, and they were all in agreement in uh, treatment options. They said they're drugs, and they're surgery, and you're out of luck. So we tried virtually all the drugs of the day, Dilantin, Felbitol, Tegretol, Benzodiazepines, um, whatever was around. But, and sometimes there'd be like this brief, what they called honeymoon period, when the drug seemed to be working. <clears throat> but those 
honeymoon periods were always brief and the seizures always returned. And at the same time, um, Charlie was losing developmental milestones. He was, you know, just over one year old. Um, he stopped being able to walk, stuff like that. Yeah, which is just, uh, it feels so helpless as a parent being told that, you know, just throw a dart at a medicine board and see which one hits. And meanwhile, nothing's working and you're watching your child, you know, suffer because of it. You eventually found the ketogenic diet, um, but it wasn't easy. How how did you come across the keto diet and what was the response when you presented it to the doctors? Well, after all the drugs failed and a brain surgery failed, um, we were pretty much told that we were out of luck and that Charlie's prognosis was continued seizures and what they call progressive retardation. And um, Charlie's main doctor was at UCLA. And one day when we were at UCLA after seeing his doctor, I stopped at the medical library at UCLA, not really looking for a cure or a therapy. I mean, he and Charlie had had seizures in the arms and hands of many of the, of the premier pediatric neurologist in the United States, and they were in, in agreement. So I think what I was trying to figure out is how we were going to get through life with Charlie's devastating prognosis. I mean, what do families do? Is he going to be able to live at home? Is he going to be able to survive? What do you do? And so I went to the library, and I think I mentioned earlier that Charlie's diagnosis was lennox gastro syndrome. So I, I started looking in the back of these medical texts for, I looked up Lennox Gasteau, and right above, alphabetically, right above Lennox Gasteau in the um, index, in the textbooks, it would say ketogenic diet. So eventually I turned to that page, and what I found was sort of mind-blowing. Now, mind you, this was the early 90s, so all the texts predating the early 90s, uh, talk about the ketogenic diet, which was developed in the, uh, 1921 at the Mayo Clinic, and for decades was a leading and very successful um, therapy for kids with difficult to control seizures. And different doctors from different hospitals in different decades use the same diet on essentially the same patient population. And their uh, outcomes were outstandingly similar, roughly a third. And this is in every decade along the way, you can find these publications. Um, roughly a third of the kids who went on the ketogenic diet had their seizures go away. Another third uh, were significantly improved, uh, with, you know, fewer drugs, fewer seizures, and for about a third, it didn't work. So you can imagine at that stage of the game to come across statistics like that was kind of mind-blowing. I mean, those are far better statistics than for most pharmaceutical drugs that you come across, for sure. Correct. So I love, I feel like going to the medical library is sort of the early 90s version of what I refer to as a Google dumpster dive, which is sort of what my parental generation has done to try and find this information um, on our kids, like hoping that there's something else out there. So you find this information, you find this research, you present it to Charlie's doctors, and what do they tell you? Well, it's kind of interesting. At the, at the same time, we I came across the information um, about the ketogenic diet in the library, um, a friend of ours told us about an herbalist who worked out of a strip mall in Houston, Texas, and evidently had herbs that were good for kids with, with epilepsy. And so we went to Charlie's doctor at UCLA and said, look, we come across two alternative things here. There's this diet and there's this herbalist who works out of a strip mall in Houston, Texas. 
and we want to try something new, what do you think we should try? And he said, flip a coin, I don't think either will work. So for actually the last time, we took his advice, we flipped a coin, it came up um, herbalist in Houston, Texas. So we piled Charlie on an airplane and we went to see this guy, nice guy, who gave us some herbs in the strip mall in Houston and came back and the seizures never went away. So finally, the doctor who wrote the most recent paper about the ketogenic diet, his name was John Freeman, and he worked at Johns Hopkins uh, Hospital in Baltimore, and he had published a paper in 92, just a year before Charlie got sick. So it was kind of hot off the presses, and it was uh, published in Epilepsia, the premier epilepsy medical journal. And in his paper, he chronicled 58 consecutive kids with seizures as bad as Charlie's and taking as many drugs as Charlie, and 29% of them became uh, seizure-free on the diet, and another 30% were significantly improved. So I called Dr. Freeman, and I asked him what he thought, and he said, send Charlie's medical records, and we did. And he said, yeah, I think we should try the diet. So uh, Nancy and Charlie and I flew to Baltimore, and Dr. Freeman and Mrs. Kelly, a dietitian he'd been working with since the 1940s on the ketogenic diet, kind of oversaw administering the diet for Charlie. And at the time, Charlie was on four anti-epileptic drugs and averaging about a dozen seizures a day. And within two days, his seizures disappeared. And it was kind of miraculous. And at first we went through that same honeymoon period, is, is this really working? But the seizures stayed gone. And when it, within a month, um, Dr. Freeman had weaned Charlie off all four of his anti-epileptic medicines. So it was just the diet controlling his seizures. Hi, this is Brandon from Cure Epilepsy. Did you know that 30% of those diagnosed with epilepsy do not respond to current medications? That is why, for over 20 years, Cure Epilepsy has been dedicated to funding patient-focused research to find a cure for epilepsy. Learn more about our mission and our research by visiting cureepilepsy.org. Now back to Seizing Life. I'm just sort of curious, how did Charlie's doctors at UCLA respond to this? After, I don't know, maybe six, eight months, we took Charlie to see his doctor, and he didn't, he didn't say much. I can tell you that now in the intervening years, um, he has retired, and UCLA has opened a ketogenic diet program in their pediatric epilepsy unit that's doing beautifully, and they have two uh, full-time dietitians, so they have started to uh, use it in their epilepsy program. But it's, it's kind of interesting. I've really never known how he felt. Now, we tried the diet for my daughter. Unfortunately, she was part of the third that it didn't work for. Um, however, you know, we had the help of dietitians sending us recipes. We had the benefit of keto being far more mainstream. There were ketogenic formulas that we could purchase. Um, you know, we had significantly more research, uh, resources, more technology to help us because it is, it's a difficult diet to maintain all of the measuring and the preparing. And, you know, I, I wonder what that was like for you sort of being on the forefront of this diet and not having the resources that parents today, I mean, this was only 30 years ago. It's not like, <laughs> like it really wasn't that long ago, but but in terms of, of technology and, and medical innovation, it's, it, was, it was a while ago. What was that like for your family? It was, it was nuts. You know, there, there wasn't even food labeling back then. So you never knew if a processed food had sugar added. You know, there's no, no way of telling. 
and Nancy used to spend hours in health food stores looking for stuff with no sugar that had some taste to it. Mrs. Kelly, the dietitian from uh, Baltimore, would fax us meal plans for Charlie to eat. Charlie didn't like the diet. He was really uh, difficult to feed. And as you know, you, when you have a kid on that diet, they have to eat every bite of every meal and nothing more and nothing less for years. So it certainly was was difficult, but you know, it, everything is compared to what? And when we were, when the results were so outstanding, I remember us thinking, well, this is a walk on the beach compared to, you know, holding this kid a dozen times a day and dragging him off to the hospital when the seizures went on too long and watching him drift away from our family because of, you know, drug effects and, and seizure effects. So compared to that, the diet, though difficult, was a walk on the beach. But you're right. Back in the early 90s, I think Charlie was one of maybe eight or ten kids in the world who was on a ketogenic diet. That just blows my mind to think about because, I mean, thank goodness, I suppose, that that we've come so far and and now it is, um, you know, if your child is seen at a major epilepsy center, the ketogenic diet is typically discussed at some point if those first initial drugs are failed, you know, but for Charlie to have been one of eight or 10 who are on this diet, I mean, it's just, it's wild so I'm encouraged that we've made progress in this in this area. And I think a lot of that is due to the Charlie Foundation, which I, I really want to talk about. But first, I want to know, how long was Charlie on the diet? Well, yeah, our experience was kind of unique. Um, normally, kids who do as well on the diet as Charlie, after a year and a half or two, can be weaned off and go on with life. But our experience was after the first two years of being seizure and drug free on the diet, when we tried to wean Charlie off, the seizures came back. And so we, we put him back on the diet for another couple of years and uh, then tried to wean him again. And again, the seizures came back. So we put him back. And it's kind of interesting to note that each time we put him back on the diet, the seizures disappeared instantly. So there's a real cause and effect. And then after the third time we put him on the diet, he was on for about a year. And when we weaned him, um, the seizures never came back. Ever. Ever. So he was six then. And he just turned 30. And he's never had another seizure, never taken another anti-epileptic drug, never eaten a ketogenic diet meal. Trust me. <laughs> and, and all those... In all those years. That's incredible. Now, how is Charlie doing today? Have you, have you seen any long lasting effects from the seizures or from the various treatments? Well, he does have some autism. The first couple of years of brain development are the most important, and certainly he was sick at least for the second year of his brain developing. Nobody can tell us whether he would have had that autism if, if we had started the ketogenic diet in an appropriate amount of time. But he's very happy. He has a, uh, a certificate in early childhood education. He's worked at a preschool that's affiliated with the Salvation Army for the last eight years, um, working with little kids. And he loves his job. And he's been playing piano beautifully for 20 years. And he's been boxing since he was, I don't know, 10, 12 years old. So, and he's, he's you know, when he was really sick and <clears throat> we would go to a new doctor, Nancy's first question to the doctor was never, can you stop these seizures or can you get rid of some of these drugs, her first question was always, 
can he be happy? And Charlie's a happy guy. What else does a parent want at the end of the day, right? You know, how did all of the, you know this experience affect your opinion um, of medical approaches to epilepsy and or the healthcare system in general? I say that this kind of frequently, and nobody really argues. But there are forces at work in our healthcare system that really have nothing to do with good health. Um, and the more, the sooner we go through that learning curve and figure out that drug companies make billions, medical device companies make billions, um, food processing industry makes billions, um, uh, diet therapy makes zero, <laughs> um, and it's very kind of work intensive and, not, and doesn't reven uh, generate revenue. And even if so, uh, insurance companies, you have, uh, are not big fans of reimbursing dietitians. Where Elizabeth Thiel, who runs um, pediatric neurology at Mass General, talks about how if she wants to prescribe ACTH uh, hormone therapy for a kid with infantile spasms, uh, which costs about two hundred and fifty or three hundred thousand dollars, and lasts for three weeks or something, um, she can get that reimbursed with a stroke of a pen. Um, but if she wants to uh, get a dietitian reimbursed for working with a few kids, it's it's a big struggle for, with the insurance companies, and so that's the opposition, and. And the sooner we get our minds around that, the sooner I think that the learning curve we go through is that we are largely in charge of our own medical destinies and the medical destinies of our children. And at first that's kind of daunting, a little bit scary, <clears throat> but once you adopt that theory, and I know this is a cliche word, but it's kind of empowering. The best piece of advice I got when my daughter was first diagnosed was from a friend's mother who um, had a, a rare disease herself, and she told me to have the fight. And I'll never forget that, to, you know, to have the fight for my daughter, to have the fight with the doctors, to, you know, to have the fight, to not just blindly trust. I, I, you're 100% spot on. We have to empower ourselves to find those answers. So to that extent, you have created the Charlie Foundation, I mean, years ago now, to help do just that, to, to make patients aware, to empower patients with information, to make sure that the epilepsy patient population is not just aware of the ketogenic diet, but also that ideally that practitioners are out there actually um, prescribing it. So what, what did you find in, in organizing and working through the Charlie Foundation? What were the hurdles to get from where we were in 1992 to where we are today? Um, what has stuck in my craw the most from Charlie's experience is that nobody told us. Nobody let us know. We didn't have the information. So from the get-go, the Charlie Foundation's mission has been to get objective information to people about diet therapy uh, so that they can make informed decisions in conjunction with their healthcare worker. That's always been our, you know, laser, laser vision um, goal. And I mean, I think at the heart of the problem is that physicians are not taught diet therapy. It's just, even though it's been around forever and even now, though there is a century of documentation of its efficacy, and even though now in the last uh, 20 years or so, there's been an explosion of, of science regarding uh, diet therapy, metabolic therapy, 
um, there's uh, physicians who don't really know about it. So I think that that is at at the heart of the problem, and it, that includes even dietitians during regular dietitian school are not taught ketogenic diet. So the dietitians who are uh, proficient in administering the diet have to have special training. One of the things we do at the Charlie Foundation is we have a list of independent dietitians that we have vetted who are experts in administering the ketogenic diet. And you can find it on our, our website if, uh, and they work independently if, if uh, that's of interest. That's amazing. Uh, thank you. So what would you tell a family, parents, who their child has just been newly diagnosed? What would you want them to know uh, about the epilepsy journey, but also about the ketogenic diet on its own? Yeah. Um, and that's kind of what we do. We get contacted by people who are new to epilepsy, as opposed to you know, 28 years ago when we started the Charlie Foundation and I was just this lone dad standing on a soapbox, you know, yelling and screaming. Today there's, uh, there are lots of physicians and scientists who are advocates of the diet. So there are published consensus guidelines, which we can send to people, written by many of the world's premier uh, epileptologists and dietitians that uh, talk about administering the diet. And the key quote to me in those, um, in the guidelines, is the diet should be strongly considered after the failure of uh, two anti-epileptic medicines. And that's considered, that's true for adults too. But that is, that's, what the medical professionals say today. We talk to uh, parents all the time, as I mentioned, and the one piece of advice that I've given more than anything over all, all these years, in particular to moms, is trust your instincts. Yeah, absolutely. Jim, thank you so, so much for chatting with us today. Thank you for all the work that you have done on behalf of certainly my family and so many other families who are, are receiving an epilepsy diagnosis today, who are aware of the ketogenic diet, who have access to it, who have epileptologists who are prescribing it and dietitians to work with. It is parent advocates like you that make that change, that, that make that possible. And so we are all indebted to you and to your family. I'm so happy that it worked for Charlie and that he is living a happy life and just beyond grateful for your time today to share all of it with us. And thank you so much for paying attention to this. I hope it's helpful. Thank you, Jim, for sharing your son's story with us. And thank you for your efforts through the Charlie Foundation to advocate for the ketogenic diet to be better understood and considered as a potential treatment for epilepsy. Cure Epilepsy knows the importance of discovering new treatments. Approximately 30% of people living with epilepsy are unable to control their seizures through current medications. The best hope is finding new epilepsy cures through research. That is why Cure Epilepsy is dedicated to funding patient-focused research. We hope you will help us in our search for cures by visiting cureepilepsy.org forward slash donate. Through research, there is hope. Thank you. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the views of Cure Epilepsy. The information contained herein is provided for general information only and does not offer medical advice or recommendations. Individuals should not rely on this information as a substitute for consultations with qualified healthcare professionals who are familiar with individual medical conditions and needs. Cure Epilepsy strongly recommends that care and treatment decisions related to epilepsy and any other medical conditions be made in consultation with a patient's physician or other qualified healthcare professionals who are familiar with the individual's specific health situation.